All right, well, thanks everyone for coming back on time. Um, we are switching gears now for the, our last session of the day, where we're going to talk about, uh, get a performance update on how the organization is tracking with our strategic measures, as well as how we measure up with other pension systems around the globe. We'll also hear about the implementation of lean processes, which are designed to improve customer satisfaction through improved efficiencies and cost-saving measures. Here to lead the discussion is our Chief of the Enterprise Strategy and Performance Division, Sabrina Hutchins. I see some uh, familiar faces, more of our team joining you today, Sabrina, but I'll uh, let you get started and introduce them. It's the middle um, one with a the face. There oh. Am I okay now? A little loud? Okay. All right, very good. Good afternoon, Madam President and members of the board. Sabrina Hutchins, CalPERS team member. I have the pleasure of opening today's session and co-presenting with several of my colleagues, including Don alum, Jan Falzerano, Anthony Sweeney, and Kareen Carolyn. Today's session is intended to share insights about the programs and enterprise management tools that we use here at CalPERS to meet our goal of being an efficient and effective organization, as well as a supportive and engaged leadership team. Before we jump in, I want to highlight our agenda so you know what to expect this afternoon. So we'll begin with the Enterprise Performance Management System, EPM, and I'll be providing you with some background for context and then moderating several updates from our executive team on our third quarter performance as well as taking an opportunity to look at our year of successes in review and highlight the work that the team has done to prepare for this upcoming year. We will then hear an update from Don alum related to our 2017 CEM benchmarking report. And finally, then we'll close out the session with Jan, Anthony, and Kareen on the good work their teams have been doing related to process improvements. It's important to reinforce that the tools and programs we'll be referring to today, of course, align back to our foundation to support and deliver on our mission, vision, and values. Specifically related to the EPM system, our framework was developed to track our progress back to our five strategic goals and our six outcome measures. The EPM system was specifically designed to manage and facilitate the development, implementation, monitoring and reporting, and ad hoc refinements of our enterprise performance metrics, as we'll demonstrate here today. The overall intent of our system is to reinforce CalPERS' desire to be transparent and accountable in support of our strategic priorities and operational expectations. So for the 2017-18 cycle, we are reporting on 37 strategic measures, 37 business plan initiatives, and 48 operational key performance indicators. Our commitment to this board last July was to provide quarterly updates to the Board of Administration on progress, specifically of those indicators reflecting a yellow or red status, which indicates at risk or off target. Our executive team has been providing these updates with an explanation of the root causes for these indicators and plans of their strategies going forward to address any constraints. We also committed to report specifically on the presentation, excuse me, the strategy side of the house, which includes our strategic measures and our business plan initiatives. However, the team provides a summary report on each one of our operational key performance indicators within our board material to maintain a transparent reporting structure. So our review and analysis of third quarter information identified that six of our strategic measures refreshing with new data are that four are on target and two are off target. And keep in mind that these status indicators are based on information as of March 31st of this year. The strategic measures tracking on target are related to customer satisfaction, benefit payment timeliness, total health care cost annual increase, and our CEM complexity score, which you'll hear more about in just a few moments. The two off-target measures are related to our stakeholder assessment survey results. All of our business plan initiatives are making positive progress forward, and you can also anticipate a uh, update from our information security office in September through a closed session meeting. And from here, I'm going to actually hand it over to Brad to specifically give you the update on the stakeholder assessment survey results. 
Thank you, Sabrina, and good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so as part of the enterprise performance management system, we have two measures that assess stakeholder perceptions. The first measure, um, the first measure is a, a CalPERS effectiveness in informing and educating stakeholders about the risks that we face in the system and the steps we're taking to mitigate those risks. And then the second measure um, looks at the success in keeping stakeholders abreast of the functions and programs we have in place to address compliance and risk. So essentially what we're asking of our stakeholders, are they aware of the risks? Do they know what we're doing to manage those risks? And they, do they know what the programs and functions we have in place to address them? We do this uh, through the survey by asking two questions uh, uh, to measure how well we're doing. And um, as Sabrina mentioned, the reason that these are off target or at risk is because in this last survey that we reported to you in May in the Finance and Administration Committee, we saw a decrease in the perception of our employers in these two areas. Um, but we're confident that we have some measures in place and I'll speak about those to increase those scores. But I just want to remind folks that across the board in the survey, we saw a decrease in the perceptions of employers in almost all areas. And in our opinion, uh, in large part, that was due to the decisions that were either made or were being considered uh, during the time that the survey was being administered. So when the survey was administered in January, uh, in December, this board lowered the discount rate uh, that resulted in increasing contributions for the foreseeable future. Um, we were considering a change in the amortization schedule at the time. And then just also as a reminder, between the 2017 survey and in 2018, uh, we had made a decision to reduce pensions in a few instances. So um, that did uh, have an effect on the perceptions of our employers. But what I want to focus on today is just take a few minutes to talk about the steps we've put in place to, to uh, increase the scores and change perceptions. And our efforts are really centered around reach, response, and reputation. Uh, and let me explain those. So since the uh, survey was administered, we've really made a proactive effort to put ourselves in front of our employer community um, with our leaders. And primarily, I will say that that's been Ms. Frost in many instances. Uh, but just to name a few, uh, we've been in front of the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers, League of California Cities and their Mayor's Council, California Special Districts Association, the Association of California Cities in Orange County, and our School Employers Association. We also uh, hosted in May an educational webinar for our employers that uh, Scott Tarando's team uh, staffed in helping to manage unfunded actuarial liabilities, and that grew over 720 employer representatives, and it continues to be viewed uh, on our YouTube page. Since then, we've sat down with 16 legislators and their staff to talk about our work. We've made visits with the LA Times editorial board, Capitol Public Radio, and then locally with, uh, in Sacramento with Comstock's uh, business magazine. Our, our message and our response has really been centered around the report that we released uh, in, in March that outlines the financial health of the system and the significant actions that the board is taking to ensure the long-term sustainability of CalPERS and retirement security for our members. Um, and we're in the process of updating that report with the investment performance that we just announced last week. Uh, so we'll be getting that out to uh, all of our stakeholders. Uh, looking ahead, we have plans, um, outlines to keep front and center before our employer community. We're launching uh, local uh, elected officials education track during the first day of our educational forum in October. I know Marcy has mentioned that in some of her reports. We also have plans to unveil a local elected officials handbook around pensions that will help navigate the complexities of our system. Um, so those are some of the efforts that we've accomplished uh, so far underway. We're operating under the philosophy to remain visible and accessible. Uh, you know, 80% of success is showing up, and we believe that is true in front of our supporters or our critics. 
so this is really about education, keeping our employers informed, and, and ultimately protecting our reputation. So I'll stop there and ask if there's any questions. Any questions from the board? I think that sounds like a very sensible and comprehensive response to the survey results. And clearly, um, these are things that uh, go up and down over time, depending on what's in the press, what's what decisions, as you say, key decisions we're making um, as a board. So, but the most important thing for us is to continue to communicate with our stakeholders, our employers, our employees, um, to members, retirees, to ensure that they um, are aware and briefed about what's driving decisions, how we're thinking about decisions, the methodical and thoughtful way that we are making those decisions. So appreciate the efforts that you and your team and Ms. Frost have, are undertaking um, to, to, to really ensure that that communication is happening. Okay. All right. You can continue. Very good. So shifting gears, now we want to highlight our first year in review and first related to our EPM system itself and the organization's maturity in managing this program. And then we'll take a look at our successes and anticipated revisions as we move into our upcoming year. So at the commencement of the 2017 through 22 strategic plan, which was last July, time goes by so fast, we also introduced the new operational component of this system, which houses those key um, operational indicators. These indicators measure our day-to-day -day operations, which are those functions that we need to be really good at to deliver on our mission. Being that this was our first year out and something new to the organization, it was important to do a thorough review in collaboration with our program areas to, to validate that we are measuring meaningful processes and to determine if anything was missing. So through this process, we've added seven new KPIs for the fiscal year 1819, and we revised several indicators for clarity and to provide more data-driven outcomes. This new reporting framework allows us to consolidate board agenda items and eliminate redundancies of enterprise performance reporting. It facilitates identification of risks and challenges with a global focus on mitigation strategies for a comprehensive review. This system drives fact-based decision-making supported by accurate and timely performance data. We've also enhanced and streamlined our communication tools to include communi uh, the combination of data and narrative for the ease of understanding of each metric. We've also created alignment maps and dashboards for visual connection and continuity. Most importantly, we've maintained open lines of communication between ESPD, our executive sponsors, and their teams, as we are all one united team working towards our common goals. Our message has been simple. This is not about the who or finger, finger pointing, but the what and how we can help each other collectively move this organization forward. As I mentioned, we reviewed the operational side of the house. We also did the same for our strategic measures and the work we need to do over the coming year to um, achieve our strategic goals. Another goal of this system is to clearly delineate between operations and strategy. And so this year we plan to formally transition those indicators to the appropriate reporting area. So with, now, with that, I'm gonna turn it over now to our executive team again for a few highlights on our successes by strategic goal, as well as what to expect in the upcoming year and we're gonna kick that off in the area of fund sustainability with Scott. Uh, thank you, Sabrina, and welcome, everyone. Um, starting with the fund sustainability, um, this goal is to strengthen long-term sustainability of pension fund, and over the past year, we had a number of successes. Some of the more um, hi highlighted ones we're gonna to cover today or go over are just the um, starting out with the ALM activities that we had in the past, um, last November and December. It was a extremely busy time and it was a very productive time for the um, organization where the investment office, the actuarial office and the financial office came together and after around 18 months of work presented the ALM workshop to the board. At that point, we um, reached a decision on a new strategic asset allocation and we also confirmed the discount rate of 7%. Later on, we, re we introduced a new amortization policy where we um, looked at 
reducing the amortization policy, uh, the amortization period for a number of gain losses that we have in our system, as well as looking at um, switching from a level percent of pay to a level dollar amortization method, looking at kind of reducing the negative amortization issues that we have in the system, as well as addressing the intergenerational inequity that we've, are, we're faced with. And then, a, as Brad mentioned, another area that we had was the Solid Foundation Report. This came out, I think, in March, and kind of highlights um, the successes that our organization has had and what we're doing to promote the sustainability of the fund. Going on to some of the annual revisions we have, we have two uh, major revisions. Um, the first one is we're just basically taking the strategic measures that Sabrina mentioned and we're moving them to the enterprise risk measure. Um, they, they're still going to be out there, but we're, it's just a realization that they're not really, it's more of a risk measure for this system as opposed to a strategic measure. And then the next item is a, a new ABS or the actual evaluation system, advanced analytics initiative. This year, um, in October, we, we plan to finalize the first phase of the AVS rewrite, where we'll um, introduce a new system, a new actual evaluation system to our enterprise. And this next phase will um, add additional analytics to the system. And with that, I'll open up for questions. Any questions from the board? It has indeed been an eventful <laughs> year, it, year it and is, a half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and you know, I, I mentioned just you know those were three of the bigger items, but um, it, it has been a very uh, busy last year. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, thank you to you all and right, your team you. for all the work. And with that, I'll pass along to Leanna. 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 Good. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so since the last time we reported on the strategic goal of health affordability, there's been a lot of success, including this board adopting the CalPERS health beliefs and also the second reading of the population health dashboard. But in respect of time, I'm going to focus my update today on the three items. First is the five uh, measures that were under development, give you an update um, on that. Also there are three new measures we plan to add to the strategic dashboard. And lastly, just making you aware of um, measures that are moving and transitioning from strategic to operations. So for the five measures, um, I am happy to report that all five now have targets and thresholds, and four of the five have baselines, which means we actually have data in our data warehouse to report to you how well we are doing in relation to our targets. So that's good news. Since we just had presentation on opioids, it, 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 I'm going to start off with that, um, both for dose and duration, give you a quick update. Um, CalPERS is an innovative leader, and we work closely with our health plans, and as a result, our current opioid dose baseline exceeds both the national and the state of California averages. So the Center for Disease Control, also known as CDC, the national average currently is 640 morphine milligram equivalents. California's average. 467, which is better than the national average. CalPERS's 2017 baseline is 317.46. So all that great work that Kathy and folks have been working on has paid off. But because we already exceed the national average, CalPERS has decided to do a stretch goal. That stretch goal will be 288 morphine milligram equivalents. You may be asking why. Um, based on that heat map that we saw earlier, there are still pockets that are uh, red, and I think uh, the doctor said hot, hot pink, but I didn't see hot pink on the screen. Um, but we, there is a lot of positive progress that we can make in those areas, and we plan to do so. So that is uh, what we're planning to do on, on dose. Um, for duration, we plan to adopt the newly released 2018 HEDIS measure, and they define high use of opioids at high dose, so basically anything exceeding 15 days within a, in a, in a reporting year and high dose is specifically 120 milligrams. So that's what they're looking at for high dose and duration. And since this is a new measure, just was adopted at the national standard, um, we will not have 2019 data or data available until 2019. But our health plans are very much aware that this is a, a performance measure we'll be watching. Um, cesarean sections. So working with Smart Care California, 
we have established a target for first time low risk single births um, of 23.9% at every hospital that actually offers maternity services. Um, so when Smart Care surveyed all hospitals across the state um, that offer those services, they found that 45% of those hospitals were able to achieve that C-section target of 23.9%. And so as many of you are aware, we do not have access to the medical records, so we have adopted that target of 45%. And when we looked at our data, only 95 of our 257 in-network hospitals that offer maternity services are actually achieving this, which is roughly 37%. So we plan to uh, continue to focus on that and making progress and reporting that back to you um, in the next reporting period. Um, for mental health and well-being, um, we heard mental health conditions such as depression are on the rise, and it is important that our members receive counseling and treatment services when necessary. Uh, I will have to also say, um, for this measure, we will be currently um, focusing on access, but based on the panel today, we will be having a conversation of additional uh, measures that we might want to be adding. So based on access, we survey our members and we ask the question if they usually or always receive the treatment or counseling they need um, through their health plans. Currently, our baseline is 72.2% um, and our target is going to be 80%. So we will be, again, um, monitoring that one. And the last of the five measures is hospital readmissions. If you remember uh, last time we spoke, the national average um, started splitting out PPOs and HMOs, and so historically we reported those together. We now have separated those. The national average is 8%. And when we talk about readmissions, we're talking about a percentage of members who experience an unplanned readmission within 30 days after an acute inpatient stay. So our PPO uh, baseline currently is 9.51%. Those are our self-funded plans. And our HMO base um, line is slightly higher, 9.79. So we're actually, self-funded plans are doing a little bit better than the um, HMO. So we will, again, be working with our plans to make progress in that area. Uh, quickly, three new measures. It makes sense. CalPERS is uh, one of the leaders in leading the initiative for lower back pain um, and that initiative, Smart Care. So we wanted to add three measures. Those three measures related to lower back is relation to opioid use. Uh, we would like to start measuring that. Also, how lower back and how our members are going and getting physical therapy. We want that they see, see that as a positive outcome, so we want to measure. And then the overuse of imaging, which we've also talked about. So those are the three new ones. The four that are moving from strategic to operations. We've done a lot on the population health dashboard, so instead of reporting in two places, we have matured. So um, related to adult obesity, adult diabetes, hospital readmissions, um, those three will now, um, which they have been, uh, being reported via the population health dashboard. We'll continue to do that, so those are transitioning. And the fourth measure is how we as CalPERS rate our health plans. We get a report on that um, regularly, so we were all also transitioning that to operations. So that is it for healthcare affordability. Any questions? Any questions from the board? No, thank you. All right, with that, I'm, <laughs> I have a lot of work. I'm going to turn it over to Marlene, who's going to talk about risk. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yikes. Good afternoon, uh, board members and members of the public. Marlene Timberlake Diadama speaking. Uh, I am tasked with the, um, I have the pleasure, I should say, of talking to you about risk management. Uh, on this slide, we have highlighted two categories of successes and four items representing annual revisions. On, in terms of successes, we had uh, earlier this year undertaken a risk and compliance awareness survey, which we sent to all of our employees. Uh, the survey asked employees a series of questions around their awareness of our risk and compliance programs. The survey question themselves were, I am aware of CalPERS risk program or CalPERS compliance program. And then the second part, it was a compound question. The second part was, I incorporate risk functions or compliance functions into my daily work. And so we took the answers. We had 1,035 individuals respond to the survey. And we took the results as our baseline in order to, uh, in order to uh, come up with an assessment and then 
make some uh, progress around improving those numbers. And so risk set a baseline of 78% representing those employees who answered yes to the compound question. Their target for the fiscal year will be to incrementally increase the baseline by 2% annually, targeting 80% uh, 8%, I'm sorry, 8% by 2022. Uh, the target itself is going to be 86%. So it's a total of 8% by 2022. Compliance at a baseline of 87%, also representing those employees who answered yes to the question. And the target for this fiscal year will be to maintain 90% or greater positive responses, a positive response rate to the survey questions through June of 2022. Sorry, I'm trying to regulate here. The second item that I'm going to highlight as a success is the security awareness topic. CalPERS Information Security Office has been actively providing security awareness information, as you all know. It sponsors data privacy day, data privacy day events to standing room only crowds and actively champions National Cybersecurity Awareness Month through, demonstrated, through demonstrations and information tables. From an active perspective, CalPERS executes regular email phishing campaigns. These campaigns mimic malicious attempts to lure CalPERS team members to click the links. Rather than deliver them to the website, these little tests, we use the data to develop improved awareness programs. And so lots of times individuals will get a nice little message back that says, you were naughty and you clicked on something you shouldn't have. Uh, in terms of the annual revisions, we are highlighting two measures and two initiatives. The first measure, as discussed previously with respect to the successes, relates to the employee survey that we had undertaken earlier this year. And so the measure that we're going to do is, as I had alluded to, it was a compound question. It was essentially one question, eliciting one response, but it was two questions combined. So we've decided to separate those questions so that we can get more specific and precise data around the actual awareness and the incorporation of compliance and risk functions into the employee's daily work. So the second measure is uh, this, is is a compliance and risk maturity assessment measures. And if you recall, we actually talked about this at last month's risk and audit committee meeting, where we uh, talked about the CEB maturity assessment programs that we, the surveys that we had done in both risk and compliance. And so that, that is actually gonna be our second measure. And then for our first new initiative, here it is in, increase compliance program maturity. Here we're going to enhance the, compl the compliance program maturity and performance by annually identifying and completing initiatives across a broad set of functional objectives and activities that strengthen CalPERS compliance and ethics culture. And this should be somewhat familiar because this is something that we, we strive to do all the time. Our second new initiative is around strategic risk measures. This initiative relates to the employee survey as I discussed above and the goal is to increase enterprise-wide risk awareness. The initiative is to develop enterprise-wide risk communications and training plans that will increase risk awareness and strengthen and expand our risk capabilities. The communication and training plans are intended to lead to programs to, that cultivate a more risk-intelligent organization, which is our strategic goal. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Any, uh, any questions from the board? Well, we did have at the last Risk and Audit Committee both a report on the risk side and the compliance side about the plan, upcoming, plan for the upcoming year. And um, really, this, these are both programs that over my tenure have matured quite considerably. But yet, you still continue to push the, the edge um, in terms of further developing this organization. I think those are really important goals. So. We strongly believe in continuous improvement. Yeah, indeed. All right, thank you. All right, with that, we're gonna turn it over on talent management with Doug. Thank you. Uh, here we go. 
get everybody ready for this. Um, so this, this item is about talent management. It's about uh, promoting a high-performing workforce for CalPERS. Um, I'm not going to focus on all these um, items today. I want to I want to sort of pull back and just talk about the employment uh, engagement survey that we recently conducted. It was the fall of 2017. It was our first engagement survey. That, uh, we used to do organizational health surveys. Got a lot of feedback from the employees. Um, they were very long. They're very complicated. Um, they were not intuitive. They didn't necessarily maybe. Uh, derive some of the results we're looking for in terms of some of the actual feedback. Um, we went to a new tool, um, we established this new survey, and uh, I, you know, we got 70% of the participation from the employees. Um, they identified us as a high-performing organization based upon the, the models that we're using um, in, in 10 of the 13 areas that, that were engagement drivers. We were in the high-performing category. Um, we have two categories we're working on right now as a collective team, and we just reported that to the leadership of CalPERS uh, through a recent uh, town hall event, uh, leadership forum a couple weeks ago. And that's already regarding accountability and then a senior and executive leadership relationships. So we were in the, um, in the um, uh, average performance in that category. Uh, we're looking to prove those, and a lot of that's based upon direct feedback from the employees about how, how, how uh, much better we can do in terms of how we engage them, how we listen, how we um, take their actual feedback. And so I'm happy to report um, we saw consistent results um, across gender, um, consistent results by years of service of the employees, uh, consistent results by the age of the employees uh, within the organization, all within really a, a few points of each other. So I think the results uh, are fairly reflective of the overall organization. Um, we would like to get more employees to participate next, next time, and that will be this fall. We are also going to be engaging in poll surveys, which will be a one-question survey to um, seek their feedback on a quarterly basis to really understand that they're still actively um, engaged in the work that we do at CalPERS. And, and the results really, I think, focus on um, having a high, highly correlated, um, engaged workforce is really going to help drive customer satisfaction. Um, it's a key driver in, in business outcomes for the organization. And I think we're going to see some of these things later in the presentation, that this connection as correlation is quite strong within CalPERS. Um, the teams also felt a very uh, strong sense of ownership of the organization and the culture, um, and that's helped to deliver sort of on their roles on a daily basis. So whatever they do at the organization, um, this connection has really been helpful to drive uh, performance. So um, they're energized, they're passionate, um, and they're dedicated. And I think whatever we can do to continue to foster that, and I think um, we've been quite successful, and I think we'll continue to grow in that success uh, in the next year. Um, in addition to that, uh, we added the diversity and inclusion questions, which we had it previously discussed. Um, it was one of the top drivers for the organization as well, and I, Mr. Jones isn't here, but I'd like to talk to him about that, a, a little sidebar conversation. Um, that was, a, again, a key driver for the organization that they felt um, very uh, supportive of the work we're doing about diversity and inclusion, the enterprise work that Brad's team is doing, really about outreach, education, communication. Uh, we've seen uh, a considerable increase in participation across the, the organization in terms of leadership, and I think um, that's been a, a genuine response to um, uh, the work that we're doing, and, and that's being reflected by, I think, the results we've seen. Um, related to the accountability and then the senior executive relationships, um, so we're doing work there. Each, each branch has taken on that responsibility, and it's taken a little different approach to how they, um, how they do that work, but, uh, you know, we did have a very, uh, uh, um, well-received, I would say, um, uh, program two or three weeks ago uh, by the executive team and um, well-received by the, the leadership of the organization. I think that's, again, reflective of the work we're doing, how they uniquely um, are embracing those, um, those drivers within their or parts of CalPERS and, and, uh, and moving the organization forward. So um, a couple other ones, just annual revisions. Um, we're, we're about to submit our annual workforce plan to Mr. Gillahan and Kelly Char for for public consumption, that's coming out. That's a multi-year plan. Um, there'll be a survey following up to that for the statewide perspective. Um, and then we're initiating other things related to competencies for leadership. They've rolled the competencies out. Now we wanna make sure that we can um, fully measure them in a, in, a, in a satisfactory way so it's less subjective and more uh, quantitative in how those competencies are being used by every uh, leader in the organization. Those have also rolled out to every employee. So irrespective of the level in the organization, each competency is now um, tied to the kind of work that they do, and, and that's something that's, I think, well received, and we're in the beginning stages of implementing that rollout. So um, I will pause for any questions, and if not. Any questions from the board? I have a question, accountability. Sure. What, yeah. can, you, can you define what that means in the context of the engagement survey? 
It depends. Um, so, that, so what we got and what we found from the employee feedback was it was, it was quite different. And so what, what I think the effective thing we were able to do is go back and ask additional questions, right? Because it says accountability. So what does that mean? And it's very unique to the individual taking the survey. And so sometimes it meant, I think, uh, and then there's, there's a counterpoint. That there's questions about, are you being held accountable? And they say yes. Um, and then there'd be a question about, well, what, about, what does accountability look like to you, right? Or what are you seeing about uh, accountability? And they might say, well, I think another manager may or may not um, uh, hold someone else accountable. And yet they always, but they all felt that they were being held accountable themselves. So it's a very interesting kind of response. Um, sometimes it was about um, their own perspectives, right? And, and not necessarily regarding the organization. Um, it may be a one-on-one -on -one relationship or dynamic. And so really the work we did in a lot of places was to go out and ask for additional feedback. If they would raise their hand or anonymously tell us what they thought that meant so we could, we could take further action. Um, frankly, on, on an in-kind of personnel side, from an accountability perspective, you're really not supposed to know what's going on. And so I think in, in a civil service system, there's some challenges that people um, may not see things happening, and in fact they are, and I think one of the challenges with that is it is what it is. I do think we'll see the, the, the scores improve. Um, I think um, getting the feedback and really just um, asking them more about it has been quite helpful because in each division and branch, um, they've pretty much been pretty open about discussing what that looked like to them, but again, it could be very, uh, very different, and so it, it's a hard one to kind of yeah. capture. And, so you uh, mean by, the, by due, due to the confidentiality of personnel items, other, their coworkers might not see that somebody's not. being held accountable, but they might You're not supposed to, and you wouldn't, be, yeah. you wouldn't be involved, and so, yeah, and sometimes fair. things don't happen as fast as people want, and sometimes, you know, so it's, it's, it's a perception issue, and I think for some respects, but um, it was unique to each individual, it, it seemed like, and that was one that, mm -hmm. you know, further work will be done, but, um, it's always interesting to talk about accountability, and yet they'll say they're being held accountable. So it's like, yeah. I like my congressman, I don't like Congress. It's like, really, <laughs> you, you, you can't have it both ways yeah. sometimes, right? So. And 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 what do you? And it's part of part of this engagement story is you're trying to measure what is driving engagement by employees. So, right. is it is it connection to the mission? Is it the innovation platform and the ability to surface your ideas and be heard, or ability to participate in leadership programs? Or is it so sort of combination of all of those? It's things? a lot of those things, right? Yeah. They're very mission driven, yeah. very mission oriented. Um, they want to do a really good job. They're looking and liking the new tools that we're providing in terms of providing engagement and feedback. I think the fact that. Um, we're doing this in a way that's either you know face-to-face -face communication. Um, we're doing it through town halls, electronically via email. I mean, we're taking on these different roles and in different ways to utilize technology. And then, and then we're doing things like small group meetings with with team members. So it really spans the um, um, the spectrum in terms of that engagement. But it's it's wanting more of that. And I think um, the fact that we're willing to do that and sitting down and spending time and engaging them on the work that they do, I think it'll be um, truly reflective in our next survey. Well, one of the things that Andrew Perry said yesterday was that a lot of companies will say that talent, that their talent is their number one asset or is the face of the organization or so yeah. important to the delivery of their um, service or product. But unless you see their talent management plan and what they're actually doing to ensure that talent is being developed and um, you know sustained and engaged, you don't, you don't know if they're actually really living that, walking that walk. And I think here at CalPERS, we do so much to really walk that walk, and it's obviously you, under your leadership and your team and the CEO, uh, that's really important work and um, enables us to deliver the value that we do to our members. So thank you for all of that. Sure. Um, any other comments from the board? Okay. All right, moving on to reduce complexity with Donna Lum. Thank you, Sabrina. Good afternoon, Madam President, members of the board, Donna Lum, CalPERS team member. Um, I'm really happy here to, to be here today to share with you some of the things that we've been doing that have led to success with regard to reducing complexity across the organization, as well as some of the annual revisions that we're going to be making to the plan. If you take a look at what we have under successes, uh, we have five different areas that we've identified and um, I'm only going to be discussing two of them because the remaining three you're going to hear about quite extensively in the upcoming report on CEM as well as some of the work that we're doing around lean and our lean framework. Um, but with regard to customer satisfaction, as you know, uh, we administer a wide variety of satisfaction uh, surveys to our members and our employers and we do it through a, di a variety of different ways. And I'm happy to share with you, um, over our performance last year, we have increased our overall level of satisfaction from both our members and our employers. And uh, we are uh, performing at a 93% satisfaction rate. 
And so if you're familiar with surveys, you know that industry best practice says if you can achieve 80% or better, you're doing well. And I think the performance and satisfaction and all the things you're going to hear about here in the next few moments is very reflective of the hard work that the team has been putting in place. The other area is benefit timeliness, and this has to do with how timely uh, we administer the payments of our benefits. Uh, we do have a target that was set by the board, and that's to achieve 95% uh, payments made within uh, 30 days. And here again, we have achieved that goal. We are performing at 95%. However, I do want to um, point out to you that there is one measure that had been underperforming, and I have been uh, providing exception updates to the board in this area, and it had to do with survivor benefits. I'm very pleased to say, and again, you're going to see here with some of the lean work that we've done, that we have significantly increased um, the level of uh, timeliness, uh, specifically within this one, and we're very pleased to, to have been able to do that. So I'm not going to take away Jan's thunder, and she's going to tell you how we were able to achieve that. We are going to be making several um, revisions uh, to this item here in the strategic plan. Uh, one of them is that we have been reporting on our benefit payment timeliness as well as customer satisfaction now um, to this board for a couple of years and in different mediums. Uh, we are going to go ahead and move this item now as, um, into our key performance indicators as a um, operational measure. And part of that being, as you can see from the other items that we're going to be pulling forward, um, you know, when we look at service delivery, there are three things that really contribute to successful delivery, and that's our people, our processes, and our technology. And so um, with the additional revisions that we're bringing forward, what you're seeing is we're going to be bringing more visibility, more focus on what we're calling our IT capabilities and our IT maturity. And all of this is really centered around um, identifying initiatives and putting in place um, things that will help to further enable the availability of technology, how we use it, uh, and specifically how we use it to deliver services. And so Christian Farland, um, who oversees information technology, has a number of plans um, that he is going to be implementing that is really going to move us further in those areas. The other thing that uh, we are also, uh, well, that information technology is also going to be doing is developing service level agreements. And this is very exciting for all of the operational areas in CalPERS as they are going to be partnering with us to identify what would be um, acceptable service levels for all of the IT services. And so again, as I mentioned earlier, IT is a critical enabler for helping us to deliver services. And we believe by bringing these new initiatives forward, um, we'll be able to apply a lot of focus and attention on the capabilities that they can further enhance and bring to the table. And that concludes my update on what we're doing with reducing complexity. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Well, clearly, this is where the rubber hits the road for us is in our service delivery to our members. And I mean, achieving a 93% satisfaction rate is really quite a stunning achievement. And, um, and also the improvements in the survivor benefits, which you have been you know, diligently notifying <laughs> us of, of the challenges there. But this, the fact that that is now turning around and that you're, you've dedicated time to improving the process through the lean effort, and I know you're going to talk about that more, but... Uh, to achieve a higher level of timeliness. I think that's such a significant achievement. So thank you so much to you and your team. Thank you. We'll be sure to share that. Okay. So um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the CEM update. And despite what some might think, this actually is a real exciting time for me to provide this report. Um, year to year, we're always looking at what can we do uh, with the system to further enhance our service to reduce our complexity and to reduce our costs. And this year I'm pleased to bring with you to you the results of our 2017 survey. Uh, so as Sabrina mentioned earlier, reduced complexity is a major component of our strategic plan. And we set out with two major goals. One was to simplify programs to improve service and or reduce our costs. And the second was to streamline our operations to gain efficiency, improve productivity, and reduce costs. So just by way of very brief background, I know we do have some new board members and other representatives that may not be uh, familiar with what CEM is. 
Um, as a very high level, CEM is a global benchmarking organization, and they primarily benchmark in the areas of investment and pensions. Um, I think you recently received a report in the investment committee from Ted and his team on the investment part of CEM, and so um, what I'm going to be sharing with you is what we do with pensions. Uh, CEM has about 70 participants worldwide in their global database, and we are generally benchmarked against eight of them. Um, eight systems that are considered to be somewhat representative of CalPERS in terms of a peer perspective, but certainly um, there is quite a distinction when we look at our level of complexity, the volume of transactions um, that we provide. Um, but overall, when you're talking about administering a pension system, whether you're big or small, you pay out benefits, and that's what we're really being benchmarked against. So if we can go to the next slide, um, this shows our design complexity. Now, when we talk about complexity, um, CalPERS is the most complex plan in the entire CEM global database. And I can't underemphasize the level of complexity, and you've heard me and, and you've heard others talk about it a number of times. Anything that we do that moves the needle even one fraction of a point in complexity is an enormous amount of work. And so what you're seeing in the complexity reduction score here is that um, compared to our results from the previous year, we, will, we were able to reduce complexity by two points. Now going back and thinking about how that was done, if you recall, we brought, back, we brought to you legislation in 2015 to reduce our retirement options. And it was a proposal that was not taken very lightly and, and um, quite deliberated by the board and, and our stakeholders. And we set out to reduce our um, retirement options from 13 to 7. That in of itself, um, the legislation was approved. It was implemented effective as of January 2018. But that's the kind of effort that it takes to be able to change complexity. Most of what it would take going forward to continue to reduce the score are primarily items that are legislatively related. So I do think that um, from time to time we will continue to bring these legislative items to you. I think sometimes it's going to really stretch our desire and appetite to make significant change. But overall, keeping, mind, keeping in mind and focus, what we're trying to do is simplify the system and to be able to deliver services to our members and employers. So uh, again, very pleased to see that we, to share with you that we were able to reduce the complexity score. Going on to the next one is our total service score. So when we complete the CEM survey, um, there are well over 200 questions and they ask a lot of questions about core processes across the organization, not just in customer service. Um, here, if you look at our score, uh, when we reintroduced going back to CEM being participating in CEM uh, in 2014, our customer service score was a 73, and I am happy to share with you that our customer score, service score has increased by two over last year, and it is a 78. I think what's more satisfying than just the score when we look at our year-over-year -year performance for CalPERS what we are also able to report is that we are above the average medium for all of our peer group. And it's the first time that we've been able to achieve that because we had been hovering below the average of the peer group. On the right-hand side of the chart there, you can see the things that contributed to the um, improvements in the scores that we have. But just to give you um, a very brief highlight, when we talk about the contact center, we, had, we improved our call wait time by more than 28%. And so our, at, our call wait time um, is at about 121 seconds, so two minutes, as compared to our peers, whose average is 274 seconds. So coupling the fact that we're very complex, the questions that come into our contact center generally aren't easy. Um, we're able to answer those questions um, in a very timely fashion. You're also going to hear from Anthony uh, when we get to the Lean Project, the work that was done uh, with disability determinations. But overall, um, with the project that they implemented using Lean Six Sigma, we were able to reduce and make determinations 53% faster than we did before the project. Uh, and then going on to um, satisfaction surveying, as I mentioned to you, um, we excelled quite well here. 
We do survey, we do have more surveys um, than many of, the, many of the systems that we're compared against. And not only by number of survey, but by survey outcome has driven the satisfaction um, response up. So I think overall, um, again, you can see that we are trending in the right direction. And again, it's an accumulation of a lot of the support that we've gotten for the initiatives that have been in our strategic plan. The next item uh, has to do with our cost. And so this takes into account all of the costs that it takes to run the system, whether it's the cost of our operating, um, our building cost, our headquarters cost, all of our customer service costs, personnel costs, human resources. Um, it's just everything that it takes to run the system. Now, I do want to point out, and you can see there uh, with the asterisk, uh, if you compare these numbers to last year, you will note that there is a change. And one of the things that we did differently this year, uh, which we had not done previously, is we took the costs that were related to MyCalPERS and we amortized them over a five-year period of time. Uh, if you go back and you look at previous reports, you'll see that uh, initially we had reported all the cost in a one-year time frame, when indeed uh, the CEM methodology is such that you, um, they require that we amortize it over a five-year period. So in prior years, when we were comparing costs to other systems, our costs seemed to be extraordinarily much higher, and it was the way that we were reporting these costs out. Now you can see going forward, we are in alignment with the way that our peers are reporting these technology costs, um, as well as how we'll be doing them going forward. The things that contributed to the reduction in costs were primarily in three different areas. Uh, one had to do with the conclusion of the MyCalPERS amortization costs, uh, given that we had completed the project and, that, and we then implemented, or excuse me, transitioned into what we called functional optimization. The functional optimization costs have, uh, or the project has come to an end, and the vast majority of the costs have already been completed and expended. The other thing that we did is we made a very conscious effort uh, when we looked at what we would, where we would dedicate our resources, uh, both personnel and budget, with regards to information technology. We implemented a very, um, I'm going to say, functional, high, robust system to deliver our customer service and to be able to provide um, information to our members and our employers. And so what we decided to do is more important now that we've got functional optimization in place is to take a step back and really utilize all of the capability and functionality that we have in the system. Uh, we had been maturing it over the last couple of years and we felt that this was the time to not increase those costs but to, um, again, use the system that we have. And then the third thing that contributed to the reduction in cost is uh, we did have a slight increase in membership. So when you reduce overall costs in the system and you have an increase in membership, that helps to overall reduce the overall costs. Um, and so that, you know, as we're looking, kind of projecting going forward, uh, we anticipate that the costs will continue to go down. Um, and again, I think it's primarily due to the large um, IT projects that we had previously engaged in. We don't foresee um, large projects coming forward. Uh, I do caution that there will be times when certainly you will see um, requests come, but uh, for the most part, we really do believe that uh, with the level of maturity and the other initiatives that IT is working on, all of those will aid in the reduction of overall costs. Great, any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, thank you very much. Tom. Okay, so there's a couple more things um, with regard to CEM, and this is going to look new to all of you. And I alluded to this earlier on, as I mentioned that we've got some new revisions that uh, we're bringing into the strategic plan. But part of it is uh, we are now going to be capturing and sharing with you information that we do get from CEM on information technology costs. On this slide, you can see that our cost per member has decreased from 2016 to 2017 by about $47. And again, that is related to um, the description that I just gave you in the overall cost uh, per member. 
Again, when we look at uh, what contributed to this, as I mentioned, there was the MyCalPERS uh, costs that have been completed as well as functional optimization. However, there are a number of initiatives that information technology undertook that helped them to gain greater efficiencies and reduce costs. They were able to reduce their consulting costs by 37%. They eliminated well over um, a lot of temporary help positions and they also reduced the infrastructure cost by 42% by a number of consolidated technology that they brought in. So again, those are very significant cost savings. And uh, again, as we were to predict going forward, we anticipate that we will see these costs continue to come down. And then lastly, uh, this is a slide regarding um, information technology capability. So, Given the fact that our business processes are very, very complex, we certainly have to have a technology platform that has the capabilities to, innate, to serve to us technology that could help us better serve our members. Um, you can see from this trend line, we've been really good at staying within the 80 to 90 percent capability uh, compared to our peers, and again, we are more complex than all of them. Uh, it is. I think it's really an accomplishment to see that our CRM capability, which is customer relationship management capability, is above the peer medium. And when we talk about C CRM, those are the things that we have in place, technology. Uh, for example, when our members call in, do we have the immediate technology to access their information to help them? We have things like document imaging, um, our data collection capabilities, our online data integrity, as well as our website functionality um, and diagnostic tools. So there are a lot of things that we do um, within information technology that really garner a really good um, capability score. And, and I know I sound like a broken record, but um, Christian has a number of initiatives that we believe are going to continue to help us mature in this area. So going forward, um, you will see that all of these um, areas we, we believe will continue um, to, to improve. If I had to summarize um, the overall CEM report, I think it's fair to say that not only are we complex, but given the complexity, we've been able to increase our customer service performance, we've been able to decrease costs, and uh, we are continuing to place focus on all of those areas as well as um, maturing our IT capability. And I think that the overall outcome of our 2017 report was very good. So Madam Chair, that completes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Terrific, thank you. Those are really quite quite good outcomes. So, and I know that you and your team have been working hard in, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, organization as complex as CalPERS it's very hard. It, each improvement is hard fought, as you noted with the uh, reduc the change in the um, number of benefit formulas and getting getting that through. <laughs> that was a big effort. Um, any questions from the board? I don't okay. see any. Thanks very much. With this, then I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jan Falzerano, and she and the team will talk to you about what we've been doing with regard to lean. Thank you, Donna. So Jan Falzerano. Um, I'm the Chief of the Policy, Research, and Data Analytics Division, and today I'll be providing a very high-level overview of what LEAN is and share with you some of the efforts that we've taken this past year um, to roll out LEAN to the enterprise. I would like to start the presentation with a very short video, and this video is played at the beginning of each of our LEAN training classes and provides a very short summary of the goals of LEAN Yet it also demonstrates the support that we have at the executive level to support the lean program at CalPERS. So any questions? Yes. So lean is intended to help us reach our customer service expectations? Right. So whether you're the first line with our members or support those that are, lean continues a tradition of strong customer service. Your lean orientation class offers you the chance to embrace a fresh way of thinking about the work we do. You're going to learn about the importance of lean thinking in pursuit of our strategic and business goals. Together we'll weave the efficiencies of lean into the CalPERS culture. Uniformity and consistency in the way we work helps harness the power of efficiency. 
What we say to our customers and what we do for them is enhanced when we are consistent. Lean principles will help us speak with the same vocabulary to each other, our members, business partners, and to our public. Our business habits will be revisited with a lean perspective. The goal is a smooth flow of work with minimum waste. We're not alone. Other government agencies are adopting lean. CalPERS is a large organization, but large doesn't have to mean complicated. Our strategic goal of reducing complexity will allow us to deliver high value service to our members without increasing cost. This class will provide a few simple tools applying lean to everything we do. At its core, lean is about maximizing value while minimizing waste. Join me at the Lean at CalPERS Spark Group. I look forward to hearing how you're leaning your world. Enjoy the class. Okay, so as you heard on the video, Lean is tied to our mission and to our strategic plan, specifically around the area of reducing complexity. So we've heard that this afternoon. So in order for us to achieve our goal of reducing complexity, we need to look for opportunities to continue to simplify our programs and to also streamline our operations. And as CalPERS becomes more of a lean organization, we should expect to see improvement in our customer service scores, increases in our productivity, and reductions in our costs, which can all be measured on our CEM benchmark. So our path towards a lean culture and towards becoming that more efficient organization starts with the development of our, a lean framework. Then we have to start educating our team members about lean and providing the tools that they need to lean their processes. And then we need to identify quick win stories or success stories like you'll hear today to demonstrate the benefits of becoming more efficient. And finally, we need to measure our performance and also use that as a tool for continuous improvement. So I'll go into these into a little bit more detail. So the first question is, what is lean? So the textbook definition is a continuous business process improvement approach to reduce waste and increase value to our customers. And so lean is actually not a new concept. It first started back in 1790, but it wasn't until 1950 where the Toyota Corporation really kind of matured the methodology of lean to where we see it today. And they are the folks that developed the five principles of lean that is used by many. So the lean centers around these very five basic principles. The first thing you want to do is you want to identify who your customers are and what do they value. The second thing is you want to map your, your steps in your process and identify what the customer values the most. The third thing is you want to find the best way to deliver that value with the least amount of waste. And four, you want to deliver it when the customer wants it. And five is you're seeking continuous improvement. So a good example of that that comes to mind for me is actually Netflix and how they introduced a new process for individuals to rent videos that was really valued by consumers. So if you remember in the old days, well, I wouldn't say old days, but um, we have to hop in the car, drive to the video store, rent a video. You might be able to keep it for three and sometimes maybe up to five days. And after that, you have to drive back to the store and turn in your video. And if you didn't do it within the time frame, you got assessed a late fee, right? So I've done that a couple of times. But you know, Netflix really provided a more convenient and efficient way to provide videos to our members. And so for me, as a Netflix customer, what I valued is, one, I didn't have to hop in a car and have to go select my video. But the thing that I enjoy the most is that I got to keep my video for as long as I want. So that means I don't have any more late fees attached if I'm late in, su in submitting my video. And then the third thing is returning the video was extremely convenient because I just drop it in the mail and I don't have to drive back to the video store. So Netflix found a way to provide that customer service to individuals that was valued by consumers. The one thing that they had to continue to work on, though, was the on-demand. Right? Often I would rent a video, but sometimes it would be in this waiting queue because it was a really popular movie, and I might have to wait three or four weeks before I finally receive it in the mail. So what did Netflix do? They started offering videos on demand. So you were able to stream your video. So immediately, you got a video within 30 seconds of putting it on your laptop or on your television at home. And then there was no need to wait for your videos to come. So this is just one of many examples, right, that how they continually seek to improve their services, they were able to keep up with their customers' need. So why do we want to lean? Well, we want to lean 
because we want to focus on improving uh, our customer service in the most efficient way as possible, right? We want to reduce waste and costs. We want to increase our productivity and services. We want to improve our processing time and quality of services so that we continue to meet and exceed our customers' expectation. So continuing to do business the same way is not listening to our customers and employer, and we want to focus on what our customers want based on what they value, just like the example that I used about Netflix and how they adapted their business process based on the things that the customer value. Oops, sorry. Michael, can you? Okay, thank you. So I want to share a little bit about the lean journey that we've uh, embarked on over the last um, 12 to 16 months. So as you heard on the video, CalPERS, along with about 20 other state agencies, are embarking on a lean journey to improve government services. So our first step, as I mentioned before, is developing that lean framework and completing the initial planning. So my team and I spent a lot of time researching. We actually met with other state departments that have been implementing lean for several years, and we learned from them what their best practices were and what their lessons learned lessons were, learned lessons were. So we took all that back and we kind of developed the kind of the straw man framework that we took to the Senior Leadership Council. And from there, we got feedback from them, we solicited their input, because we wanted to develop a framework that made sense for CalPERS, right? Other organizations might be implementing lean their own way, but that doesn't mean that it met our business need here at CalPERS. So the Senior Leadership Council developed the framework that I presented to the executive team, and the executive team supported our framework development, and we moved forward with actually implementing the framework. The first thing we did is we partnered with Cal HR to help us certify in-house trainers for us to actually conduct our own training of Lean to the enterprise. Instead of sending people to external training, we're able to provide that consistent training within CalPERS. Second, we launched our enterprise-wide training just as, actually this past spring. I think it was late April after we certified our trainers. We did some pilot classes, and then we initially rolled it out to the enterprise in late April, early May. And as of June 30th, about 18% of our CalPERS team members have already completed a Lean White Belt training. And we actually have enrollments. All the classes are filled through the end of August and first part of September. And we're going to continue to market the messaging of Lean so that we can eventually um, train as many people as possible throughout the organization. Um, we have a few individuals, a handful of individuals, specifically in the Policy Research and Data Analytics Division, that we um, began the in extensive training and certification process for the more advanced Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt training. So the Greenbelt training requires a lot more data and statistical analysis to identify process improvement opportunities. And so we're seeing some very successful outcomes as a result of the lean efforts that we've done as well as the Six Sigma. And so Anthony, Karina, and I will each be sharing um, a story with you. And I'm gonna start with the first one. So um, my green belt completed a Six Sigma project in the pre-retirement death benefit case study. So the goal of the program was to release survivor benefit payments within 30 days so that beneficiaries can receive their benefits more timely. And additionally, the second goal was to reduce the number of cases going over 45 days because we want to increase our customer satisfaction, make sure they get their money timely, and the added bonus also was to avoid any penalty interest for cases that exceeded the 45 days. So we actually did a couple of very um, quick lean uh, processes. The first one is under the streamline the process by reducing or combining several steps. There are two things that we've done under this area. The first thing is in regards to benefit payments. And so this is probably one of the most time consuming and complex steps in the entire process. And in the previous process, team members would gather and wait for all the documentation to come in from the beneficiary before they started calculating the benefits. Well, when we mapped out this process, we identified that there were opportunities to streamline where we can start the calculation earlier in the process while we're still waiting for the documentations to come in. And as soon as the documentation comes in, the calculation was already near or completed, and so that we were able to reduce the number of time that it took to complete the case. The second thing we did under this area was on the steps in the process and how an individual case was actually distributed across multiple team members 
kind of similar to that assembly line concept where each individual had a role in that entire process. So unfortunately, this required a lot of handoffs between one individual to another individual. And so we reduced the number of steps. And so instead, we assigned the case to an individual member, um, team member, that shepherded that case from the beginning to the very end and avoided all the unnecessary handoff. And we were able to reduce the time it took to process that case. The other thing we did was streamline the communication with the beneficiaries by adding a direct line for our team members. Sounds like a really simple concept. We reviewed the data and identified that about 50% of the calls were escalated to the program area for response. The call center was able to respond to 50% of the calls, but lots of times they might have more detailed questions that are specific to their application that would require the program area to assist the individual with. So when we identified and took a look at the data, we were and seeing that 50% of the calls were being backflowed to the office. And sometimes, depending on the, the workload of the unit, it might take them one or two days to call the member back. And when sometimes, unfortunately, they got their phone messages, right? So then the beneficiary would have to call the call center again, and then the call center would have to escalate a workflow item to the back office. So as you can see, there was a lot of extra steps in that process. And we identified for some of the cases that were aging over 45 days is because there was a multiple attempts from both the calls from the member and the beneficiary as well as the CalPERS team member trying to reach a hold of the member. So not only is this not the most efficient way, but it also caused frustration for our members. So the team identified, let's add a direct line that goes to the unit. So by doing this, the unit was able to resolve 75% of the calls on first contact, and then the remaining 25% of the calls were transferred to the assigned team members and for immediate resolution. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, so as a result of those simple changes that I just mentioned, this is a visual representation of the number of days that it took to release payment. So the horizontal axis actually demonstrates a sample of all the cases in the chronological order starting from January of 2017 through June of 2018. And so we sample 600 cases, 300 pre-implementation, and 300 post-implementation. The vertical axis shows the number of days that it takes to actually have that case um, completed. So as you can see, based on the data, Prior to the lien improvements, on average, payments were released in, within 27 days. However, but you can also see that there was a lot of variance from case to case. So some of the cases were between 30 and 45 days. A lot of the cases fell over 50 days. And then, of course, we had cases that even exceeded 70 days. So post-implementation, as you can see, the majority of the cases actually fell below 30 days. A few of the cases fell between 30 and 45 days, and it's difficult to see there, but there was two cases that fell uh, and exceeded the 45-day mark. So not only did we reduce the average number of days to release payment from 27 days down to only 17 days, the new process significantly improved the percentage of payments released within 30 days, so that it shot up over 31%, as you can see here, and the percentage of cases that exceeded 45 days went down to less than half of 1%. So as you can see, the lien improvements do not have to be big or complicated and can result in these kind of significant results. And so we'll continue to look for other opportunities to improve service to our members, as lean is always about continuous improvement. So now I'm going to hand it over to Anthony, and he's going to share about the Disability Retirement uh, Lean Six Sigma project. Can I interrupt for the, with a question from the, from the board sure. before we move on to Anthony? Ms. Brown? Um, so I love data, so thank you for your little plot there on this slide. Um, I wanted to know um, what months were these um, 300 um, studies uh, done in? You said this one was pre-lean and one was post. So was it at the same time frame? No. So we started January. The data ran from January of 2017 to June of 2018. When we finished the post-implementation, that was around January, February of this year. So then the post-implementation, I think, was between February and June. 
So I have a problem with that because you've got a lot of holidays in there. This is what I was thinking. You've got some holidays in these other days here, which could in fact make your data seem skewed. So um, and as someone who does data and demographics a lot in my job, you would want to do it over the same time period to see actually if the improvements that, that are is real. So one of the things about Lean is that we're going to continue to go back and keep monitoring the data. So for the duration of when we actually completed this project to the time of this presentation, we're not done monitoring the data. We're going to continue to quarterly go back and assess the data and keep updating this to make sure that we have the consistent data that we need to make sure that we're continuing to provide that quality. So it is only four months of data that we have right here for post-implementation, but we will be going back on a quarterly basis tomorrow. So just that. be sure that you're using the same period of time that you're doing it in, because over the holidays, it's going to take you longer, because less thank people you. working. Yeah, thank Thanks. you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? OK, continue, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam President, members of the board, Anthony Sweeney, CalPERS team member. And I'm going to talk about a Lean Six Sigma experience that we had even prior to bringing it globally to CalPERS. In 2014, we had an opportunity to partner with CalHR and the Government Operations Agency to pilot bringing Lean Six Sigma into state government. So we, we started out on this process, and as we learned more about Lean Six Sigma and what we wanted to accomplish, it was about making major improvements to a customer service project, process, not just small tweaks. So we were looking for that right process. And as the champion of the Lean Six Sigma effort, I was able to look in our benefit services division at a process that could benefit greatly from Lean Six Sigma. So what we did is um, we, we looked at our service levels in our area and the processes. And what we really wanted to look at is our processes from a customer service perspective. So regardless of what our service levels were established at, we were looking from the customer perspective, what did those look like? And that was important because um, the project that we chose, Disability Retirement Determinations, which is an important process for a member asking for a disability retirement and we're approving or denying those disabilities, um, our service level was six months and completing 70% of those in six months. And while at the time that seemed reasonable because one, it was a complex process, an important determination, and we were working with so many external entities, the member, the employer, independent doctors. So that time frame seemed reasonable, but as we know, the customers, a lot of feedback we got from them is that is just too long for this important decision. So we thought that process was ripe for Lean Six Sigma. So just like Jan said, we mapped out each step of those processes, and then we put timelines on each one of them, and how long did each step in that process take? And once we put all that together, we were able to find the three major pain points of the process. So the first one being the intake process, as we call it. When we get the application from the member and ask for all the medical documentation, and then gathering that complete documentation up and getting it to an analyst. And the second piece of that is then the analyst reviewing that information and determining if we needed an independent medical examiner to send that member to to get that independent medical uh, opinion. And then lastly was getting the information back from the independent medical examiner and then making an ultimate determination of that case. So we mapped out those time frames and this is what it looked like. The blue being where we were now and the red after looking at where we thought we could lean the processes and what time frame we could get to. So the blue, while we were meeting this 66 months, 70% of the time, the average time it took was eight months to make these determinations. So you can imagine uh, how the customer felt about that. So we set out this goal to accomplish these within four months, or the majority within four months. Um, that's 70% within four months. 
And so how did we get there? Um, first, we looked at this proactive customer service model, pulling the process forward to make phone calls to the members. So what we were doing is we were relying on system-generated letters over and over telling the member, we didn't get all your completed information. Please send us more. Uh, you have another 21 days to provide this information. But, but many times the, the member just kept sending the same stuff. They didn't understand really what was needed. So we reached out with this high touch approach, calling the members and then not just prolonging the, the, the timeframes. So we need this information by these dates. It was really doing a disservice to them by keep sending these auto-generated letters and not getting anywhere. Um, second, we improved our customer service uh, educational materials. So not only to the member, but to the employer and to our doctors. And that included publications, forms, letters that we send out, making them uh, more informational, getting their feedback about what should be said in those letters to help them understand the process better. And while Lean doesn't focus on technology improvements, that's not the goal of Lean, we did find some technological improvements that could be made that helped us shave time, such as um, our data sharing with our doctors. We were mailing medical documentation back and forth with them and we were able to find a, a technology solution to securely and safely exchange that information much more efficiently uh, and timely. And then we were able to really hold our independent medical examiners uh, to their agreements with us. And we had always thought this was kind of out of our control because they're the doctors and they need time, but um, we were able to call them high touch please return this report in, within 14 days. That's what it says in your agreement. Um, this was rarely happening prior to Lean Six Sigma. Now it occurs over 86% of the time we get those reports from the doctors within 14 days. And then we were able to just eliminate waste in the process as we talk about Lean. These, these include uh, secondary signatures, too many managerial signatures, too many reviews and waiting to determine if I should send to a medical examiner or not, um, reducing the amount of paper that we send, the amount of relevant medical records. So we, we found a lot of enhancements in that area. And then lastly, we were also able to develop better reports for the team members to use to manage their workload to tell them when certain time frames were being reached and to take action on those, to reach out with proactive calls. And so that gave the team members uh, more tools to process their work more quickly. So in the end, Donna gave a little bit of spoiler of this earlier, but uh, our, I mentioned our goal was making determinations within six months. And prior to lean, we were hovering around 67, 70%, which was our goal. Um, in June of 2016, when we had time to implement all the processes, train all the team members on it, and fully get implemented, we reached a peak and we've sustained that peak of 93% uh, of our determinations are now done in six months. And the average time, which is really the critical piece of this to make our determinations, went from eight months to just over three months in making these determinations. And then our new goal was make these determinations in four months and not six, so a 33% increase. And we were only doing 20% within four months prior. And now we, were at, we are at over 80% of making those determinations within four months. So as we implemented Lean, and we've seen this not just with the disability retirement processes, but with other processes, um, both in what Jan talked about and what Karine will talk about, we found other benefits from Lean. Um, initially, when you put these Lean teams together, they're cross-functional. Um, they're from all levels of the team, uh, from the entry level to the management to the analysts, and this this cohesive team is able to propose decisions and make these improvements together. 
There was also uh, that cultural change I talked about, about what does the customer want from us? Not what our service level is, but what would the customer expect? So it gave the team a new perspective. And then it brought positive improvements. We always say, um, it's always been this way, so that's the way we do it, or we can't control that how fast that doctor gets us information, or that employer, and it, it really changed that thought process because they didn't think these goals were achievable within the team because of those external factors, and it got them over that hump when they saw the results. Uh, we were also able to enhance our quality insurance, quality control processes, review more cases for quality assurance, and improve that level of review. And then it allowed us to take on new initiatives as well. And one of those is one we've just completed this last fiscal year, and that's our reevaluation process. So that process was, we were doing about 200 reevaluations a year. We were able to increase that over 50% by this year. And that's because team members were able to expand their capacity to do these other activities in disability retirement that are now also streamlining our processes. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, we do have a question, Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you, this is uh, very impressive. I do have one question for you though, but um, so did the percentage though of disability approval or denials change? I so, mean, because you know, you're doing going faster, yep. so are you just denying more faster? Absolutely. So one of the, one of the key goals in Lean, uh, as you learn through the training, is that you're never sacrificing quality um, in order to speed up your processes. And we did, we did not see a great change in the number of approvals versus denials. We did see our denials actually go up slightly. Um, within percentages, so there was, there was not a great change in the number of approvals or denials in this whole process. Great, That's, that would be helpful to know. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's quite a stunning result, I have to say. And I imagine that the team feels really energized and sort of proud of what they've accomplished. I mean, such a, such a huge undertaking and to have such impressive results. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. definitely. Any other questions on the board? Okay, you can get to continue. Thank you. Um, so I'm Corrine Carolyn. I have the privilege of leading the Customer Service and Outreach Division. And our division is comprised of our contact centers serving both members and employers, our eight regional offices that provide um, in-person uh, retirement and health benefit counseling to members, and then our employer and member education programs. And so you've heard about some large projects from um, Jan and Anthony and CSOD, Customer Service and Outreach. Um, we kind of took a different approach where we looked for small, quick win things that we could do with just introduction to lean training, um, no additional cost, and no overtime. And we were successful in doing three early lean projects that have really improved employee engagement and really demonstrated to our team members that we, our division adheres to um, CalPERS mission, vision, and values, and that the customers are our number one priority, and that we are here to meet and exceed their expectations. So, we looked at feedback from our, these folks that are, they're, they're facing our customers. They hear from them every day. Um, we're lucky we get some of the first feedback because we, we take the phone calls, we see people in person. And so our managers that had gone through the introduction training went out and started asking their team members, what are you hearing? What are you hearing from our employers, our business partners that are, are not customers technically, but they help us and, and we want to support them um, and empower them because they're serving the same members that we are. What are you hearing from the members that are calling? What are you hearing from people that are attending our educational programs? What are we doing that we need to do better? Or what are we kind of falling short on where we're not really meeting their expectations? Um, so based on that, what we did was we targeted improving the customer experience through reducing complexity, eliminating waste, and using our resources more strategically. So our first three lean efforts um, involved improve, improving our employer educational materials, 
aligning our temporary help resource schedules for the times when we had our highest um, call volumes, and also leveraging technology to improve our time off scheduling in our contact center. So um, the process we used is very similar to what uh, Janet and Anthony already talked about. We mapped out our current state or our current business processes. We eliminated any steps that weren't adding value to our customers. So if the customer doesn't want to pay for it um, and it's not a legal requirement, we need to look at whether or not we really need to do that. Um, we focused on how to make things less complicated for our customers because they may not value us making it super simple for us. We wanted to make it simpler for them and also concentrated on reducing costs wherever we could. Um, as we went through the process, we continually maintained our focus on being responsive to our customer feedback and to their expectations. So our first project involved our student guides. Um, we have a very extensive employer education program. We try to help them understand the laws and the business rules and the MyCalPERS system um, to promote compliance and help them do business with us um, as easily as possible. Um, our program is really valued by our employers, but one thing our trainers heard was that a lot of employers wanted to send more people, but it's a time commitment. It's a time commitment to go to a three-hour class. Um, and, and sometimes, particularly for some of our smaller employers, that was, that was just cost prohibitive or, or they did not have the time to do that. So what we looked at doing, we had one of our trainers who was actually a participant in another great program that CalPERS has, the Emerging Leader Program. Um, we looked at how could we condense our training materials um, and still provide a comprehensive education and support our employers. We um, eliminated any redundant or unnecessary information that was duplicated in other resources that were readily available. We improved our student guide, that's kind of like our curriculum that we hand out that they can take with them. We, uh, we improved their readability, we improved the presentation. And we also were able to reduce our class lengths as we kind of got rid of some of the duplicative material. So the results were, we reduced our page count by 47%. So instead of, I should have brought um, a visual, but instead of a booklet that's this thick, you now get a, a little pamphlet, um, which you can also look at online. Um, so we reduced that by 47%. We're saving over $18,000 a year simply on printing, you know, some educational content. So that's a, it's a small thing, but it's important, and it, it's important for the team members who um, get to see that savings. Um, we also were able to reduce our class duration by 33% or more. So one of our most popular classes is our health business rules. That was a three-hour course after our lean process. That's dropped to an hour. Um, what that has meant is that employers can send more of their folks to our classes, more people can get that education and improve their interactions with CalPERS as well as their compliance, um, and we can also offer more classes. Um, the good news is, um, although this is early because we recently rolled these out, our satisfaction rate from our employers attending our educational programs um, has traditionally been in the mid to high 90s, and it remains so. In fact, in the last month, it is trending upward. So we're hoping that we, we, do, you know, we continue to assess and, and look at all of the comments we receive. But so far, we have seen that employers are still getting the value and the benefit of the education, but we're just doing it in a more efficient manner. Our next project involved um, tackling how we schedule the work hours of our temporary help. We use retired annuitants in our contact center. And before we did this project, scheduling and tracking the retired annuitant hours was a pretty cumbersome manual process. We had team leaders that were spending time creating spreadsheets, you know, mod uh, monitoring people's schedules, et cetera. Also, the schedules were based more on when the retired annuitants wanted to work rather than when our peak periods of customer, customer demand were. Um, our workforce management team researched how to use our existing technology to automate the schedule processes based on our peak call volume periods. Um, they analyzed historical data as well as the forecasted workload to design simplified schedules, and that balanced our retired annuitant availability with our customer needs. We also created a new mechanism for retired annuitants to pick up 
extra shifts if they wanted to when our call volume was going to peak. This actually allowed us to reduce our overtime costs because we didn't have to pay permanent staff to work overtime. We could simply pay our temporary help at their regular rate, so we saved money. We were able to make sure that we could maintain our service level agreement of answering 80% of our calls within 60 seconds without, you know, again, increasing overtime and just by aligning our resources a little more strategically. Sorry, technical difficulties. Oh, hello. Okay. So the results of this process were um, we, again, we, we eliminated the manual work. We no longer have team leaders with manual spreadsheets trying to track retired annuitant schedules. Um, we, they, they are now able to do more, um, I wouldn't say more important, but perhaps more critical, <laughs> critical tasks. Um, we ensured fiscal responsibility by using our temporary help more wisely, and we improved our customer experience by having uh, people available when the customers are calling. And the last project I wanted to talk about is um, how we improved our contact center vacation planning process. So in a contact center because we're always having to balance our um, team members you know, need to use their accrued time with the customer demand. Um, we have to plan our vacations six months in advance, which doesn't allow a lot of flexibility for our team members. Um, we also, our old process was highly manual. We had um, at least 20 hours a month being spent by team leaders trying to manage people's time off requests and balancing those against customer need. When we started looking at this as a lean um, process, this was suggested by a, uh, a team member who had gotten off a call with a customer who said, why is everyone on vacation? And although they weren't, um, it gave pause and she was um, willing to bring that up to her team leader and it prompted us to have a discussion about are we doing this correctly? Are we really meeting our customer needs while you know, ensuring our staff get time off? So we started looking at our existing forecasting technology and we realized we weren't really leveraging it. We weren't, we weren't exploiting it like we could. Um, so we had our workforce management team really delve into it. Um, by really looking at it, they were able to um, use the technology to more accurately predict customer demand and then tailor our time off allotments to, you know, around that. Um, additionally, uh, we were, we, are, we improved the accuracy of our forecast. We were able to build in buffers, so even if call volume spiked while we had people on vacation, we were still gonna meet our service level agreements and provide excellent service. We were also able to eliminate all of these manual steps to process the vacations. We also simplified the request process for our team members, and because of the accuracy of our forecast and continual updating, we're able to offer time off not just on a six-month basis, but every month we can say, we've updated our forecast and now we have these new slots available. So it really has cut down on unplanned absences, because unfortunately, sometimes people would call in if they didn't get the time off that they needed. Um, and we're still ensuring that we're meeting our customer demands. So again, we saved about 20 hours a month of our team leaders manually trying to manage this vacation process. Uh, we improved our customer service because we have um, team members there to help them when they call us. And we were able to leverage existing technology to improve our accuracy. And we did not spend any additional money. We didn't have to purchase anything. We just learned how to use our current system. So um, customer service and outreach was an early adopter of Lean. We are super excited about it um, because we get so much customer feedback and our staff are so energized by hearing what the members need and, and wanting to serve them. So we're really excited to have this systematic approach for uh, getting customer feedback and then we can take action on it quickly and it doesn't cost a lot of money and it doesn't require special expertise. It requires common sense and time and support from team leaders, which we have. And it's so, we, we've seen it as Anthony talked about, we've seen it really help employee engagement because we know our employees are engaged when they feel productive and they feel connected to our mission, vision, and values. So they're able to, they're 
they're encouraged, and in fact, the team leaders solicit, we wanna hear what are you hearing from our members? What are you hearing from our employers? What do you suggest? How can we improve this? What can we do better? And then our team members are able to share that information and come up with their own ideas about how to improve our processes. So the ownership that comes from the folks that were involved in these processes and some others that you'll be hearing about, um, just have really improved uh, morale, improved engagement, and are keeping, um, we're developing staff as they get to learn project planning and you know, how to write procedures and business process improvements. So we've just seen so much value, and um, at the end of the day, we're improving our service to members, which is you know, why we're here. So, any questions? Terrific, thank you. Any questions from the board? Yes, Ms. Taylor. Hi. So. Thank you, that was a great presentation. I, uh, your customer service outreach division does exactly what? So we are, we have the contact center, so we answer the phone calls for members who are calling about their benefits or other things. We also answer calls from employers who are doing business with us and supporting members. Okay. We operate our eight regional offices throughout the state of California where we provide in-person counseling to members who may want to retire or people coming in um, for survivor benefits or a variety of other things. Um, and then we have a um, member, we provide the member education program, so the online and in-person classes, and we do the same thing for our employer community as well. Okay, that's a lot. So and we do, we do the, oh yeah, thank you. We do, <laughs> yeah, one of our most popular things is our um, CalPERS benefit um, education event, so our CBs that we That's do. That's what I thought you yes. meant. Yes, yes, okay. we do. Okay, um, so your call centers, are, is it hourly call volume? I'm sorry? Uh, the call centers have hourly call volumes, right? We, we don't have quotas. We get about, um, we get between 1.9 to 2 million calls annually. So you get a lot of calls. Yeah, and our yeah we do, and our okay. goal is to answer 80% um, of all those calls within 60 seconds. And actually, I'm happy to report that we've even dropped further from our 122nd average. We're now down, I believe, to 57 seconds is our average time to pick up um, the calls. So trying to get you know get to those members and employers as fast as possible. That's really good. Thanks. That is that's very very good. Um, so uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, you had two projects for your, hold on, let me make sure, retired annuit and scheduling and then scheduling vacations. Vacations overall, but retired annuit and scheduling. Right, the retired annuitants is just their work schedules. Because they're temporary employees, um, there's some more flexibility in their hours. They're not necessarily working eight hours a day. Right. What we wanted to do though was make sure we had those temporary resources at work when the highest customer demand. So when the calls were highest, we wanted to have those extra folks there so that they were serving the customers. Um, and prior to that, we had kind of been a little more flexible in letting them decide when they wanted to work, but it didn't necessarily, necessarily align to when the customers needed them. Okay. And, yeah. so, so are they mostly on the phones or are they all over in, in this department? The retired annuitants um, are the ones that I'm talking about now are on the phones. There are 26 of them. There's only 26 of them. Um, on the phones. We have a couple in our regional offices that help support as well. Okay, so um, how big is the phone area? How many people? We have 136 full-time employees, and then we have some additional employees that do electronic correspondence. So I believe it's 160 FTEs for our contact center, so the phone and electronic correspondence. Okay, and then the, and that's inclusive of the 26? No, the, that would be in addition to the 26 retired annuitants. And that just helps on high call, call volume? They help with the high call volume, yes. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Yeah, my comments are really for everyone that is presented in this section. And bravo. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, this... This is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. I came to state service, um, and prior to that, I was working for a, a Japanese corporation and um, had been very, very immersed in this. And for some of you who may remember the Wilson administration, and for some of you who probably weren't born yet, um, there were early adopters in state government doing this stuff back then. 
uh, pioneer projects uh, with industry, with ASQ, then it was ASQC, Sacramento Area Council for Total Quality, Statistical Process Control, Value Stream Mapping, on and on and on, Lean Six Sigma. And I've seen these efforts kind of spring up in various places in state government. We had a California state office, statewide office of continuous improvement um, that spearheaded this work back in the dim distant days of yesteryear. But there's never been the leadership, the continuity, and the culture to have it survive transitions of departmental leadership, of administrations. Um, some of the most recent iterations didn't really survive the transition and were killed off. Um, and then administrations somewhere usually after about three years or so say, oh, we gotta figure out how to make things better and they kind of rediscover all this. And so it's um, very encouraging to me to see this going forward in such a systematic and effective and well thought out way in an organization where I believe it really has the potential for continuity beyond an administration. We're somewhat removed from the politics we have strong leadership, strong continuity, but more importantly, you can integrate this and are integrating it to be part of the DNA, part of the culture at CalPERS. And so finally, I'm really encouraged that we will see these approaches that I've been kind of an evangelist for for 30 plus years, really taking hold, showing results, and having a real future. Uh, where they won't get scattered to the wind and, and forgotten and reinvented uh, an administration or two from now again. So just bravo, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gillihan. Thank you, Madam President. And David, thank you for endorsing this. Um, I just wanted to say that th this, is a, this administration's been very committed to this, but we've approached it in such a way that hopefully it will carry on uh, in future administrations, and that is as we've been rebuilding the state training center in the aftermath of it shut down during the great economic decline, whatever you want to call it. Um, our, our focus has been uh, on, on a subset of the, the, the broader calendar, the broader roster of courses, um, and, and, all we're, and all we're trying to insource is our leadership development, which is, includes the 80-hour the basic academy, supervisors academy, the 40-hour management development, 20-hour executive stuff that we put into statute as part of CSI, um, uh, and all the lean stuff. And so those two pieces are our focus. We're insourcing that. We've, um, the, our, the state training center is probably 12 positions now. When I got to Cal HR, it was like three. Uh, we got six new training officer positions. It started July 1, thanks to the legislature. And so, uh, so that is our focus, and we hope to, to, to keep this as a culture within the state of California. Uh, I will tell you, we've trained uh, I, thousands of state employees that are white belt certified. We have several hundred people are T for T uh, white belt certified. We're focusing on the, the yellow belt and stuff of, of like that now. So, um, but we're committed to this and, and uh, yeah, we didn't invent it, but, but we, we knew, we, we saw the need for it in the state government along with a lot of other people. So, thanks. So, thank you both for your comment. That actually segues into our final slide um, very nicely. So, you know, we are just in our first year of implementation of Lean, and so we're gonna continue to do the expansion so that we can roll this into even more of a Lean culture here at CalPERS. And so we're gonna continue to kind of highlight these success stories that we share with you today, and as we have more success stories, we're gonna continue to promote those through the Spark and through other kind of communication efforts. We are also partnering with GovOps right now to kind of identify those kind of statewide metrics for Lean improvement. Uh, we're going to continue to expand the training, as uh, Mr. Gillihan just said, and we're going to be expanding to the Yellow Boat training and continue to work with CalHR in, ex in the expansion of the training. So as the green belts in our organization become more experienced, we're hoping that, and actually we, we just started that already, so they can start coaching others on the lean improvement processes, and eventually those green belts will become black belts, which is the most advanced analytical series of the Lean Six Sigma. And so ultimately our goal is that everyone's gonna be speaking the lean lingo, I guess, you know, 
how can we become more efficient and how can we lean things. And then, of course, eventually into our lean culture, we want to roll that into our talent management, into our rec in recognition program, and just keep replicating our process for that continuous improvement. And so if there's no other comment, we actually like to close with another short video um, that was created by the CSOD section to specifically kind of highlight some of the projects that they did that Corinne... Um, I'm Corinne Carolyn. I'm the Division Chief over Customer Service and Outreach. Um, and here at CSOD, we've been trying some new things based on the lean techniques that our CEO has introduced, um, as well as our commitment to meeting the customer's needs. One of the things we're excited about is um, a change we made in our employer contact center where we implemented a team lead pilot. This is a way to support both the managers and the phone agents answering employer calls in a way that saves money and really develops some of our AGPAs into strong team leads. My name is Peter Fotis and I work on the internal agent assistant line. Our primary duty is to assist frontline agents with escalated inquiries. The team lead pilot was developed through our management team in the employer contact center to give us an opportunity to enhance our role with frontline agents. We can give direction and guidance uh, through navigation, explanation. We can do that at their desk, actually showing them where to navigate. We can also review by email if they send us an inquiry um, or Skype for a quick clarification. We've been able to improve the response and the training to reduce the number of calls uh, to escalation and therefore reduce the number of calls uh, made by employers. So another thing that we tried was based on the employee engagement survey results, we were lucky in that we had great engagement scores, but we wanted to continue what we were doing well as well as kind of hone in on what we could do to improve and kind of get some of our scores up in, in all of the areas. So we started holding a series of engagement brown bags where senior leaders and team members um, get together and just talk through what's what working well and what we can improve on. These brown bag lunches happened during the span of all of our lunch hours, so that way they're able to catch all of us. The regional offices are, be, are able to chime in also. We've got the webcams going, and they can hear us, see us, and chime in with their questions and their feedback too. I always feel like we're limited by our own imaginations. Yeah, I had one question, but you know what? I may not have thought about the question that somebody else brings in and it pretty much all interests me. <laughs> it's a chance for two-way communication because I do believe our management needs to hear about what they're doing right. That's part of how they know they're on track. So yes, it's an opportunity for us to learn about what's going on with CalPERS Big Picture or Seesaw Big Picture, but it's also an opportunity for us to give our management feedback about all the amazing things that they are doing right. Here at Seesaw, we put a very high value on customer feedback, and also the team members that work closest to the customers have a really good idea of what they really need and what they want. So we spend a lot of time um, soliciting feedback and input from those team members, and then we take action on what they tell us. My name is Michael Hadeen. I manage the member education unit. So my team's role at the CBs are to basically facilitate and coordinate the events. We have so many different internal teams that participate at the CBs, um, and just keeping up the communication is really important. From talking to my team, nobody had ever provided a survey or, or kind of asked all these team members, you know, what do you think would be a good improvement to these events? And so I think that's what kind of sparked my interest in, in creating these surveys and getting them out to those internal team members. We received feedback that said, at the end of classes, members are coming in, other members are trying to leave, they have to hand out evaluations, and so there's a lot of moving parts. So the biggest change that we made to the CBs was that we installed a transition team. It's basically some specific team members who are gonna go to those classrooms and help the room monitors uh, basically transition their rooms so the members that are coming in, they just have a smooth experience and the internal team members who are working in the rooms aren't as stressed out as much. I think it's important to let the team members know that we're here for them and we're here to support them. And if they have an idea that's gonna make the event uh, a better event for the members, then we're all ears and we wanna, we wanna help out too. 
At the end of the day, customer service is what CSOT is all about. It's our passion, it's what we focus on, and we're committed to listening to our customers, to listening to the team members who work with those customers, and getting ideas from our frontline team members about how to do our jobs better and how to provide our customers the very best experience. Thank you. Well, that concludes our presentation. Is there any final words or questions? Well, thank you so much. I think this, um, this, this presentation on Lean really demonstrates how committed CalPERS is to driving value for our members and, um, and the, process, the really important processes and, uh, that we're putting in place in order to achieve that. So thanks to all of you and your team members for pulling this together and uh, the continued focus on, on Lean and process improvement throughout the organization. So uh, with that, are there any final questions or comments from the board? All right. Oh, please. please. So as, as many of you know, the success of any organizational change is really the adoption and the ownership of the mid-management. And so the four individuals we have here, and I know that there are several supporting you as well, but the four individuals we have here who represent the Senior Leadership Council, where we've delegated much more decision-making to this particular group. Um, it's part of our succession planning. These would be successors for you know positions sitting around this table, and I think at least two or three of them are in the plan. Um, I also wanted to thank Jan uh, Fazerano in particular. This is Jan's last week with CalPERS. Uh, Jan is leaving us to join the Covered California team. And so we wish her well, um, although we're very sorry that she's, uh, that she's leaving us. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, yes. <laughs>